I want you to ask, how do I correctly pronounce your name? Oh, Juanzi is correct. Your pronounce is correct. Yeah. Juanzi? Juanzi Li? Yeah, Juanzi Li. Li is my uh, last name and Juanzi is my first name. All mm -hmm. right. And it, it, it's okay if I do the Western sequence or should I should I use Li Juanzi? You just uh, pronounce uh, me Juanzi. It's okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Simon, are you are you here? Yes, I'm here, but I'm right, so you... confused because of Alessandro. Why right, I... that, that's what I, that's what I'm asking. So that your edit, okay? I already sent him a, a Zoom invitation to join us directly to the panelist room, but I guess he didn't do it. Uh... So maybe just wait a couple of minutes. And Gary is not in the waiting room either. We're we're waiting for Gary Marcus as well. No, I can't see Gary in that in this room. Okay, can you hear me now, Alessandro? Yes. Okay. Right. I had, uh, okay. I had, I had to, that was a good solution. Yes. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I had to join with my iPad because uh, there was no way with the PC, which means that I need Pascal to maneuver my presentation if it's on the problem later. All right. Good. Um, I'll do that. All right. Okay. Do you also see my screen? Uh, and uh, Gary just sent me an email that he'll be here in a minute. All right. Okay. Thank you.
I suggest we still start punctually. Um, and uh, hope that you guys can sort the kind of advancing him to panelists and stuff like that in the background. Hoping that there will be no issue with the Gary. Right. <laughs> Are we actually already audible for the audience? Uh, yes, we are also live for the audience. Right, I was just, otherwise, I, was just I can't uh, play the sponsor videos. All right. So, hello, everybody. We're uh, waiting okay. For... I, I, see, I see Gary. Uh, Gary, I just sent you a promotion Excellent. to the panel. Okay. Uh, click uh, join or admin. Uh, okay, he's coming. Excellent. Yeah, I hear nothing anymore. Yeah, I, I actually, yeah, okay. I, I actually didn't have audio during the video. Was there supposed to be audio? I am already in audio audio. Yes, I was uh, writing to the, the organizers. Oh, and okay. The, yeah. Okay. okay, great. Gary, yeah. hello. <laughs> yeah, the, the audio was not, uh, so the audio of the, of the video was not, uh, it, it was not possible to hear the audio of the video. Okay, okay, okay. Well, but we seem to be audible according to the chat, so that's good. Can you hear me? I'm going to have to restart um, for uh, technical reasons, so I'll, I'll, I'll be right back. Yeah, okay. All right, let's let's just wait a minute because uh, Gary needed to reconnect. So let's let's wait until he's here, um, assuming it will be quick, and then we'll get started. Seems still more people connecting. So it's probably good to wait a minute anyway.
let's give it one more minute and then we'll we'll start uh and gary can reconnect in parallel You can't hear me, can't see me? Well, now we have you. Okay, great, excellent. So let's get started. Excellent. Um, welcome everybody to uh, the panel on is the deep learning hype good or bad for the semantic web? Um, very happy you're all here. We have four panelists and I want to dive right in. Um, if you, well, you, you know the program. If you don't know the panelists, you should. So I don't want to use the time to make lengthy introductions. Look them up on the web if you're not familiar with any of them. The links are on the on the uh, uh, on the program website. Let me just briefly announce who's here: um, Li Juanxi, Tsinghua University; Ilaria Tidi, uh, Frey University at Amsterdam; Gary Marcus, New York University, and founder of Geometric Intelligence and Alessandro Ultramari from Bosch Research and Technology Center and Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So very happy you're all here. Um, the way we will do this is that we will have brief seven minute statements by the panelists and then we'll just open it up for a discussion. Um, questions, you can ask questions primarily via chat or Slack, uh, the Slack channel for the, for the, uh, for the panel, uh, if you use that. Um, if you want to show your face during the panel, it's usually nice for the presenters, you know, to see a video, then just raise your hand and Simon will, will uh, you know, uh, uh, enable that for you. Uh, it may also be helpful if in case you have a question that is too awkward to ask in chat and would you like to kind of do in person, uh, just raise your hand and we'll do that. All right. And with all that said, oh, my name is Pascal Hitzler, um, Kansas State University, so I'll be chairing this and I'm very happy to do so. We'll take turns, and Zhuangzi, uh, you'll be you'll be the first. Uh, we can't hear oh, we you can't right hear now. You. Uh, thanks, you. Pascal. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you may uh, want to share. I will your screen. share my screen. Yeah. Uh huh. And can can you see my slides? Yes, we, we see we see your interface. Um, so okay. with the with the draft slides, but we can see it. Okay, it's it's okay. Yeah, no, so, it's full screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks Pascal for the introduction and the invitation. The topic is very interesting and uh, was thinking. I'd like to give my understanding of it from the perspective of uh, techniques. At first, I want to begin my statements by reviewing the goal of semantic web when it was proposed by Tim and James. In semantic web, the information is giving well-defined meaning and by enabling computer and people to work in cooperation. Over the past 20 years, the cement web has achieved a lot in machine understanding, meaning representation, and open knowledge theory. And also, it lay foundation for logical reasoning and the semantic interoperability. At the same time, machine learning has made a greater process progress uh, due to uh, thanks to the deep learning and uh, every day uh, the many new technique words filled us such as uh, uh, bird pre-trained model gpt and uh, 
encoder decoder. And also we have shared the successful application in uh, speech recognition, machine translation and the content generation. However, the first statement I want to say is that deep learning is powerful, especially good at learning with big data, but it cannot understand the meaning of content. content. We conduct a conceptual knowledge problem to, to test if pre-trained language model has uh, learned the knowledge about concept, which is very important in human cognition. We design three tasks, conceptual similarity judgments, conceptual property judgment, and the conceptualization in context to perform the problem. The experiment's results for a uh, pre-trained language model so that uh, it's far from the performance of human level. So currently, pre-trained language model cannot replace knowledge base. But it does not mean that deep learning is bad for knowledge, a uh, semantic web. Instead, I want the second statement I want to say is that deep learning is good for semantic web and uh, semantic web should embrace deep learning. As we know, both semantic web and deep learning have the advantages and uh, their limitations, but they can help each other. I want to illustrate this uh, by using this diagram from uh, three aspects. The first is we can use printing language model as a resource. As we know, semantic web and the printing language model both meet open world assumption. We propose a knowledge completion model using prompt based on printing language model. Experiments so that printing language model can make structured knowledge more open and complete. Uh, we can see it can not only remember the knowledge in the text, but also can infer new knowledge from existing knowledge graph. The second is that we can use printing language model and deep learning model to be the boost to enhance many web tasks. We found that pre-trained pre language model is very used in many semantic typing tasks. Uh, it can easily specify using uh, prompt uh, techniques to describe the, the semantic typing tasks. And also we can find the pre-trained language model pre provides new paradigm for semantic matching. Uh, this gave the experimental result for anti-alignment by using deep learning enhanced model and the result using uh, and the tradition and traditional anti-alignment model. The experimental results show that deep learning based anti-alignment model has doubled the performance of the traditional anti-alignment model. Also, we can see the self-supervised and unsupervised anti-alignment model can achieve the almost the same performance compared to the uh, supervised anti-alignment method. The third aspect I want to say is that the semantic knowledge can be the guidance of printing language models. Uh, Xiaodai is a dialogue system by using printing language model. We propose knowledge grounded dialogue generation model. It can make the printing language model generated rep response more informative and it can lead to the faithful needs and the engagement needs of the conversation. Here is a result of the number of the round by using knowledge grounded model and the result using knowledge ground models. Uh, so combining methods of knowledge driven and day driven is main direction 
for the next generation of uh, artificial intelligence. The fellow of Chinese Academy, Academy of Science, Professor Zhang Bo, uh, proposed to study the triple space uh, to combine these two models. And the Turing Award winner, Binger, uh, proposed to study model of a deep learning tool to perform uh, knowledge reasoning and uh, planning. And also academy, uh, American Academy of Engineering, uh, Jeff Hawkins proposed Southern Springs. Uh, all these are potential um, framework for combining knowledge and uh, data driven methods. So to summarize, uh, I think we should keep our uh, initial intention of semantic web, uh, focus on the study in context of deep learning and uh, knowledge reasoning. We can treat the printing language model as a resource and uh, make use of the advanced deep learning models so as to achieve the web intelligence. Uh, that's all for my uh, statement, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Juanci and Ilaria, please. Mm -hmm. I, I stop the uh, things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you hear me, right? And then you should be able to see my slides, correct? Yes. Yeah? It looks good, yes. Okay, so um, um, I hope I will be a bit, hi, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending or good evening, whatever you are. Um, I want to uh, try to be a bit controversial and taking the part of where did the um, knowledge go in this debate of whether deep planning is good um, or not uh, for the semantic web. Uh, so what I did, I first so we are hearing a lot about scenario symbolic integration. We hear about the discussion, all these discussions about pros and cons, or cons of neural versus symbolic AI. We want to integrate it too, uh, but the web has a bit disappeared from this uh, uh, from this discussion. So one of the questions that I I, um, uh, I wonder is: Are we still uh, are the original aims of the web still considered relevant in this discussion or not? Um, then I went back to the original web vision. So this is really um, Tim Berners-Lee. I'm happy that uh, Chansey also uh, took the same approach. Documents of the web. So this was 2006, if I'm not mistaken, 2004, 2006. Documents on the web should describe real objects and imaginary concepts um, and give particular relationships between them. And then in this way, computers could become capable of analyzing all the data on the web, being content, links, uh, transaction. Uh, this was the, the dream that, that Tim Berners-Lee had, and then our community has been uh, working actively uh, toward this, this direction. Uh, if we look at this, uh, these days, actually, with deep learning, computers can, we can say that computers can analyze data on the web by themselves. Uh, so one way of looking at it could be that we, uh, with deep learning methods, we might not need uh, RDF anymore. Um, of, of course, this is um, this is a bit an overstatement, and that but maybe what we need to do is that we need to rethink a bit the semantic web mission, particularly in the perspective of integrating deep learning and 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 the semantic web. So maybe we don't need to approach this as we need to create intelligent agents that so that that analyze the web. Uh, but we need to focus about the semantic web as um, a place where uh, we can create a knowledge interchange, which is unambiguous, where knowledge is unambiguous. Um, for these, there are things where deep learning can actually help. So deep learning can provide use cases uh, for, for the semantic web. So we imagine just like the typical example is a recommender system that uses um, uh, uh, uses link prediction over a knowledge graph. Uh, it can help dealing with noise and inconsistencies. We are now um, dealing with a, a vast amounts of knowledge in knowledge graphs or knowledge graphs at scale. 
uh, but we often encounter inconsistencies and noise and, 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 and deep learning can, can help uh, supporting that. It can definitely learn, uh, help extracting from large structured data. So that's web scale learning. And somehow uh, one thing that deep learning is, uh, can help is on capturing complex semantics. Uh, so there are sometimes there are uh, we do have lots of vocabularies, lots of ontologies that uh, that help us defining concepts. I mean, uh, uh, the biomedical data can describe genes and, and sequences and disease and, and relationships between them. Uh, we do have uh, data for catalog vocabularies for cataloging or describing geographical data. But sometimes we do have um, classes that can, or concepts that can be hard to explain. So class boundaries become very difficult. And um, uh, we um, uh, humans learn from examples and deep, deep, deep learning does the same. So maybe complex semantics is something that needs to be captured by, by deep learning. Uh, there are things where deep learning does not help, and this is where we need to need to go. So the, the most of the web, the, the data from the web are rare or unique um, events, and we we want to learn from that as well. Uh, we can't uh, uh, learn, we can't throw away the the unique events from our data because our, our, otherwise we will overfit our models. Um, it can't replace symbols, so. Um, uh, we still need structured knowledge to train these this, this, this models. So deep learning needs symbols, even though um, they, they, uh, they are kind of um, uh, opposed. And then also, if we look at, uh, at, at, at fair data, uh, findability, interoperability, so the, 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 um, uh, the linked data principles, um, these are still not deep learning problems. So while in the semantic web, these are really relevant problems. Um, so, so one one solution, one thing that I try to, one idea that I try to bring uh, forward is, um, is is knowledge science or, or or knowledge in AI. That's how we can call it. So we need to get back a bit on on thinking the knowledge that we are creating. Um, uh, I, I like to call this empirical semantics. So we do empirical analysis on the on the knowledge graphs that we are creating. We try to understand. The, the way we model and the, the, the overall semantic of the knowledge graphs that we create. Um, and then we check for the usefulness of, of, uh, of this knowledge, um, so the usefulness, the limitation. Uh, this means that in order to, 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 to integrate properly semantic web and, and deep learning, we need to also acknowledge the limitation and failing of both methods. So not just the ones of deep learning. So maybe say asking is the deep learning hype um, good or bad for the semantic web is a bit misleading. Maybe the hype is in both directions. Uh, but in general, we need to try to move and shift from thinking, okay, how can I fit knowledge into a learning process to which knowledge do we need to fit? Uh, these are my statements. Thank you very much. And um, I need to stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, Pascal, you are muted. I'm taking over the screen and um, when it looks good, okay. Alessandro, then you can. Okay, can you hear me and see me? Yes, I can. And I'm swapping to full screen. So it should be full screen now. All right. Sounds good. Thank you much, Pascal, for helping out. I'm actually connected with my iPad. Hopefully everything goes well. Um, so yeah, when, uh, uh, hi everyone. Uh, when, when Pascal asked me uh, to think about uh, the good uh, and the bad of the semantic web, probably uh, you know because of my cultural bias, I added also the ugly. And so, if you can go to the next slide, please, uh, uh, Pascal. Yeah, thanks. I don't see it. Okay. And so, um, I think you know this again is something. Uh, it comes very natural to me. Um, and so here is my take when I have to think about uh, you know deep learning um, and the hype and how uh, the deep learning hype influences the semantic web technologies. So next slide, please. We start from uh, from the good. So uh, unity makes strength, right? So uh, if we look at this uh, so-called virtual cycle, we see that you know in general knowledge graph technologies. Uh, can improve machine learning and uh, machine learning can improve knowledge graph technologies. 
where, where the benefits really are benefits uh, in terms of performance, efficiency, robustness, uh, and explainability. So if you click, uh, Pascal also here, a couple of animations. So um, some examples uh, uh, of this uh, unity are also recent, right? So uh, some colleagues of mine have organized, I think yesterday, uh, um, a tutorial on knowledge-infused learning for autonomous driving. Uh, then uh, again, if you click again, uh, there was a, a, a book uh, that uh, was published last year, I guess, on narration policy AI, um, state of the art. Uh, um, other, well, for instance, my colleague, uh, Corey Hanson, and I wrote uh, in the context of Bosch uh, um, a blog about how we use neurosymbolic AI methods for scene understanding in autonomous driving and traffic monitoring, um, which is also public. And then um, we are also organizing uh, next uh, year at Triple AI a tutorial on generalizable common sense reasoning, which actually is a way to show how we can infuse knowledge into language models and improve accuracy in, down in downstream tasks. Uh, uh, that for instance are question answering in terms of common sense and other type of approaches. Next slide, please. So what is the bad here? So I thought right away to this, uh, you know, uh, 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 notion by uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, of philosophy as uh, uh, ancillary to theology. And so of course here, if we look at the metaphor, seeing the semantic web as uh, uh, ancillary to deep learning means that uh, all the topics that the semantic web technologies are about or will be about uh, become a derivative of what's uh, more important in terms of methods and problems of deep learning. And so this is, of course, you know, something bad because it, it takes the autonomy out of the semantic web uh, domain. Next slide, please. So the ugly, uh, and here, you know, again, in terms of being controversial, uh, the ugly is that uh, pretty much uh, there would be no more need for knowledge or ontologies or even ontologies at all. And then we will rely a little bit more on uh, what can be summarized as uh, alchemy and oracles. And I will explain actually in the next slide what I mean. Here, just you know, again, uh, I, show, I, I found these uh, nice pictures of the Oracle of Delphi, the Piscia. And then I also found, because you know, I'm visiting my family actually in Italy, this old picture of us in Innsbruck, I think, with me, one of the ontologists by Paracelsus, uh, who of course who is an alchemist. So next slide, please. Um, so why alchemy? Actually, you know, uh, Ali Rahimi uh, in, uh, at NIPS uh, a couple of years back uh, said that, you know, uh, um, he's very worried about uh, uh, not uh, using verifiable, rigorous and for all knowledge uh, uh, in terms of building AI systems that govern th things like healthcare, uh, elections, civil dialogue, uh, and not just alchemy, so just, you know, methods that are hard to uh, uh, understand uh, uh, deeply. And, you know, NIPS is not really known as a coven of ontologists and semantic uh, technologies, right? So I think this is uh, worth, uh, worth mentioning this quote. Next slide, please. Um, and, and in terms of oracles, where uh, there is this nice, uh, I think, you know, paragraphs from uh, a recent book by Michael Lynch, uh, where he said, basically, you know, forget taxonomies, forget psychology. We don't need conceptual models. We just need, uh, because we are living in the age of big data, we just need to take uh, uh, data, throw them at uh, uh, these algorithms, and let them figure out uh, what are the patterns, what are the behaviors uh, that are more uh, relevant. Next slide, please. And this is my conclusion. So, you know, wrapping up and also trying to leave a, bit, a little bit the metaphors that I use. So, I think that in general, for applications that span from knowledge construction, leap prediction, neuro symbolic reasoning, as also other panelists have touched upon. Deep learning is, I think, the greatest, the greatest friend that semantic technologies has, have. But if the middle of this hype moves too much towards deep learning, then the risks are pretty clear to me, at least, that semantic web and semantic web technologies become like a nice to have complement of deep learning or become even worse, so the ugly, negligible. And so replaced altogether by purely numbers throwing solutions. So finally, you know, there is this saying in Latin, again, cave hominem unius libri. So beware of the man that only knows one book. And I think we also have to be beware of uh, machines that only know one solution, that is the deep learning solution. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alessandro. And uh, let's switch to Gary. And um, while we do that, 
um, let me remind you, and, and you can already, you know, if you have questions for the panelists, put them either in the Zoom chat or in the, um, or in the Slack. Um, and then we'll kind of go, go through questions as they come in. So please feel free to do that. If you'd like to show your face, uh, raise your hand and somebody will kind of give you the, the ability to do that on Zoom. Gary, please. Can, can you see my slides? We're good. Um, yes. <laughs> so um, without a stable foundation, uh, I think semantics will never be reliable. Semantic web will hence never be reliable. Um, there's lots of talk about foundation models these days, like GPT-3 and DALI. I assume everybody are familiar with those. Um, if you don't have a reliable foundation, you're not going to get to reliable AI. The fact is these systems are not reliable. I've been giving examples like this for a few years now. Um, the one on the left is from 2020. You poured yourself a glass of cranberry juice, but then absentmindedly you pour about a teaspoon of grape juice into it. It looks okay. You try sniffing it, but you have bad cold, so you can't smell anything. You're very thirsty. So you, and then GPT continues that you drink it, which is fine and statistically probable. And then it says you are now dead, which happens to be statistically probable in its corpus in some superficial reading of the statistics, which is all that it can do, um, but it's not biologically plausible. So the biological reasoning is terrible um, or completely unreliable. The so sociological, psychological reasoning is pretty bad too. Human says, hey, I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. GPT-3 says, I'm sorry to hear that, which is a great statistically probable answer. The human then says, should I kill myself? And because humans often say you should do things, GPT-3 says, I think you should. Obviously, it is no underlying concept of the semantics of death or suicide or anything like that. Um, I just came out with a paper yesterday with, with a couple of colleagues looking at Dali, um, looking at questions like, or prompts like, the man saw the lion with the binoculars and it's not getting the underlying ambiguity um, that a human being gets. Or the man eats pizza, but the woman does not. So this is negation and ellipsis, fails on that too. So we looked at um, eight categories that are in <coughs> common in linguistics, common in the languages in the world. And when you look at these things with precision, Dali doesn't understand them at all. There's lots of other problems like sexism um, and misinformation. I think these are probably pretty well known, so I won't go through the slides in depth, but I have examples if anybody cares. Um, um, they're pretty brutal though, the misinformation, because you get things like some experts believe that the act of eating a sock helps the brain to come out of its altered state of meditation. They sound perfectly plausible because of the statistics of putting the words together, but conceptually they're nonsense. It's a serious problem. And I don't think we want our semantics web to be a um, purveyor of misinformation, but if we use these tools unadulterated, that's what's gonna happen. Um, fundamental reality of contemporary AI is that deep learning works well with routine things, but very poorly with unusual cases. So big data is great, small data, you get out into the small data regime, which unfortunately you need to do in the semantic web, you have a problem. Um, on the subject of alchemy, there's this wonderful uh, cartoon from XKCD, and I think it captures the problem, which is you can always pour more data into your big pile of linear algebra. If your answers are wrong, you can keep stirring the pile, but it never works. So, you know, you add more data and you still get things like Sally's favorite cow died yesterday. When will the cow be alive again? And the system says in a few days. That's not what you want your semantic web to be telling you. Um, so deep learning is a better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. Um, what would be better? Um, I think it's a long story told in my book, Rebooting AI with Bernie Davis and a slightly shorter story in an essay called The Next Decade in AI, um, which is a little bit more technical and more recent. Um, I think we need at least four things, a hybrid neurosymbolic approach. So we need to have neural networks to do our learning for us unless we find something better, um, but we need the abstraction power of, of classical AI. We're never gonna get away um, with a successful solution that's not a hybrid. Um, uh, the Achilles seal of neural networks is they don't generalize outside as training space. Nowadays, people call it distrib distribution shift. I've been pointing this out um, for almost 20 years or over 20 years. Um, it's still why we need neurosymbolic systems because of generalization um, uh, issues. Here, here's an example with a huge, massive network 20 years later, um, having trouble generalizing, uh, I think it's three, uh, sorry, two digit time two digit multiplication beyond cases that are in the training set. You go outside the distribution, accuracy falls. That's always gonna be the case with the current kinds of architectures. We also need a lot of explicit knowledge. And of course, semantic web people are very sympathetic to this, but a lot of the knowledge that we need is not necessarily explicit on the web. So if you break a bottle, it contains a liquid. Some of the liquid's probably gonna escape the bottle. 
we know that it's probably not out there on the web. There's actually more stuff on the web about death than breathing, but that doesn't mean that we die more often than we breathe. Um, whoops, skip that one. Um, some of that knowledge probably has to be innate, and that's part of why it's not specified, because we all know it. Um, we have to um, deal with that. Um, we ultimately need to deal with reason and, reasoning and complex co uh, cognitive models. Um, there's a great example from Doug Lennett from the Psych Project, which I know is not so popular anymore, but showing how it can make complex inferences about Romeo and Juliet and magic death potions and what people believe about them and so forth. Nothing we can do in deep learning is close to that. You have to have a model. You have to have knowledge that you can reason over. So to sum up, if I still have the time, I know I'm pushing it. Um, here are seven things, that, and I'll just say the names of them and stop. Um, seven things that I think are necessary for a strong foundation in AI. Rich cognitive models, extensive real world knowledge, representations of relationships between entities, compositionality, which I was just showing you Dolly doesn't have, uh, common sense knowledge, reasoning, and human values. Until we have all of that built into our semantic web, I think we have a problem. We'll get, you know, 80%, but is that good enough? You know, in a world where 20% misinformation can lead to people not taking uh, vaccines, lead to spread of COVID, um, lead to insurrections and elections and so forth. Um, I don't think it's enough. We need, we need to have these things if, if we're going to have uh, reliable, informed people. And I think that's what semantics web ought, semantic web ought to be about. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Gary. Any, anybody, questions or comments, please utilize the chat. Um, so let, let me start and, and um, tr try to look out a little bit uh, from here and, and, you know, kind of project forward. Um, and that's really a question for everybody who wants to, who wants to answer that. Um, kind of right now, there, there's a deep, big, deep learning steamroller, right? So, I mean, there's a ton of activity. Um, what do we project? What what will that look like in five years or in ten years? Um, and and what what kind of do you think will be the hard limits of the deep learning approaches currently being looked at? Me? I know we're all guessing yeah. here, but so yeah. Anybody who wants to take it. So so ten years from now. Um, we will remember deep learning, but we won't be using it. We will have found something that is much more efficient um, in terms of how much data and energy it requires. So we'll, we'll keep the spirit of statistics and parameter setting, but we'll do it in a better way. Um, but we'll still remember deep learning because it showed that this was possible. And we'll be back to reasoning and we'll think, man, those all those years, 50 years, 60 years where the neural network and the symbol people were beating up on each other. That was a total waste of time. And if, if there'd been more cooperation sooner, we could have gotten here sooner. Did you say five years or 10 years from now, Gary? I think five years is a day. 10, <laughs> ten. ten five, were, five were still going to be struggling. We were going to be moving towards that. Uh, stage of recognition, but we're not quite there yet. I mean, it's starting to happen. Like when Bengio, as, as one of the slides points out, starts saying we need system two reasoning or Jan LeCun says, and this is a quote, AI ML sucks. Well, when these people start to realize the current tools aren't enough, that's the beginning of the transition. Yeah, so, so actually, I mean, uh, I, um, if, you, if you look at history, there have been all these, always these two waves that kind of at some point, some symbolic becomes uh, prominent again, or symbolic AI becomes prominent again. And every time the new iteration, we have new methods that, that improve. Um, I think, I, I totally agree with you. So in, in 10 years from now, there will be a, a shift into, um, into this. So we will be looking at, at, at deep learning. I'm not sure we won't be using it anymore. Maybe we will use it less. And, um, but I think as a, as a semantic web community, so as the symbolic AI community, we really need to now come up with uh, say new method that, I mean, that improve the, 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 the past, um, uh, um, the past generation of our own methods. Because again, every time we have a cycle, our methods improve. Um, so before we had like um, simple neural networks, now we have like uh, deep architectures. So the same way before we had small ontologies, we have uh, large scale knowledge graphs. And then what, what is coming next? This is where we really need to focus, I think. And it's also important, in my opinion, uh, uh, to not forget that, you know, when we talk about new methods, there are also methods that can, you know, like uh, I think Gary mentioned cognitive modeling and cognitive models. So there is, you know, a tradition of 40 years uh, of people working on cognitive architectures, 
And all of a sudden now we hear that it's so important to model the cognitive mechanisms. There is actually, there are methods, there are studies on that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And I think we need to be aware of this because otherwise we just discard the cognitive science and all that comes from there, right? If I could just add one word, if I add one word, it's integration. So indeed there are a lot of existing uh, mechanisms, but they're not integrated with, with the new tradition. And, and we need to take a lot of great ideas from the past and, and put them in a new context. Thanks a lot. So um, I'll refrain from commenting myself. Um, let, let's go to what, uh, Claudia, you want to you wanna ask the question since you're uh, you have no, access I'm, to... I'm fine if you if you if you no go ahead. go ahead okay. go ahead uh, so uh, first thing uh, I really like the position from uh, Ilaria in which she was trying to highlight uh, that maybe we need to think about how to take the portion of, of, of knowledge that we need and for injecting it when we, we, we do learning um, this is something that I would like to highlight somehow. And I have a question with, uh, for Alessandro. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, you somehow highlighted that uh, uh, data, the mass of data, you mentioned big data can bring up uh, as a, a lot of uh, uh, information and uh, ideally we can uh, uh, exploit this uh, huge mass, mass of information for <clears throat> Uh, grasping some some content somehow. Uh, we uh, a few years uh, a few hours ago we had uh, the the first keynote of the day uh, that was uh, actually uh, talking about uh, ATKI and uh, from Francesca Rossi and uh, the topic was uh, ATKI and uh, how the main pillars of uh, the current uh, ATKI are not actually compliant with the, the um, uh, heterogeneous environment that characterizes uh, the semantic web. So I would like to know how you relate this uh, attention to the mass of data, which I, I believe I, it's a great source of information with the, 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 the topic of ATKI, which is uh, largely discussed uh, both in industry and uh, in academia, because it, it has a large impact uh, also in the everyday life. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think this is a big topic. Uh, you know, recently, for instance, you know, I can talk about, uh, you know, Bosch. Uh, uh, there is now a, a, um, a, a protocol and, a, and, a, and a, a series of policies that Bosch has put in place in terms of uh, um, ethical AI and ethical principles, which you know include uh, many ingredients, it's not just one solution for everything, but it, it includes <laughs> the capability, uh, so explainability you know, as a feature, uh, uh, trustworthiness and security when transferring data. So all these topics, I don't think they are peculiar of the semantic web uh, per se, but should uh, are important for every side. Uh, uh, of, uh, of AI uh, in, uh, in general. And, uh, and I think we, do, we should take them very seriously. Uh, now, um, if we look at the technical aspect of this, uh, and of course, uh, again, here we have many, many problems and many methods to solve them. Uh, back a few years ago, I uh, was at, at CMU and we worked on uh, a system to uh, try to basically uh, elicit uh, the, inf the content, the knowledge into privacy policies to make sure that uh, you know, people that uh, click on I agree really know what they are agreeing upon. And this is not trivial. And, and semantic web technologies were helping there because of course the idea was uh, extracting, extracting a structured data, representing them and trying to basically help the user navigate into the knowledge. So you know, I think uh, uh, overall, complex problem. I think we have tools as a semantic web practitioner uh, and scientist to, to help uh, and also to guide uh, uh, the community. Thank you. Actually, Any other comments on this? Ilaria, go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking that, um, I mean, I agree with Alessandro that um, in the, the, these are, the, I mean, the ethical aspect is actually something that uh, it's not necessarily we should, I mean, we should be dealing with, but it's part, I mean, everybody should. And maybe also, this also relates, I, I think Gary had something on, on, on the human aspect and ethical aspects in the foundation of AI. 
Um, and this also relates to the, what we were discussing before, what we'll be looking at, uh, how we will look at in, in, in 10 years from now. Maybe um, we won't be looking at neurosymbolic, but we will be looking more into the direction of this. Uh, you know, now we have a lot of uh, projects around this hybrid intelligence, where uh, in, in Europe there are several projects and consortia that, that work on this. And the idea is to go beyond neurosymbolic integration to also include ethical aspects, human aspects, societal aspects. So maybe uh, we should also consider these as part of the looking at, uh, into future directions. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that I think a lot of people are allergic to building machines with values, but they don't recognize that to not do so is also to make a choice, and that it's probably a worse choice. I always think of the Winston Churchill line um, about democracy being the, the worst of options tried. I, I think that if we build machines that we don't build explicit values, we just wind up with racism, sexism, all kinds of toxic stuff. Um, bias in terms of loans, bias in terms of you know pr judicial decisions and so forth. And to to not do something is to come up with a pretty lousy outcome. I think it's absolutely essential that that we build in ethical principles. Just one you know silly example is uh, well, it's not a silly example, but one one small example is for years we've been seeing things like. Google and the gorillas and African-Americans, and then people put band-aids on them. They patch these problems, but because the patches are so narrow, the problem never gets solved. So somebody gave me an example the other day of a web search for CEO and the top 50 results were all male. That doesn't statistically correspond to reality. It corresponds to an outdated representation of convenient sample data on the web. It's not actually what we want. That's an ethical choice to decide, are we gonna stick with the convenience samples and perpetuate whatever bias was out there or are we gonna do something different? We have to make that ethical choice. And right now we're making it in the wrong way. Can I quick comment on that? Uh, I mean, uh, don't you think that this is exactly the role of uh, modeling knowledge for driving somehow the way in which we learn just from the data? Well, the problem is that the answers that we want aren't exclusively contained in the data, and we have to we have to acknowledge that ethically. And if we don't, then then the default is that we just stick with what's in the data. But there are many domains in which the data are kind of behind the times. They represent you know stereotypes that have developed over hundreds of thousands or, or even uh, you know many millennia. And so, if you just take what's there, a convenient sample, the found data then you make the decision, it's okay to perpetuate those stereotypes. In my view, it's not okay to perpetuate them, but you cannot move past that unless you make, take an ethical stand and put in some knowledge there about what, what a desired outcome is. You can't re directly reflect the data, in my view, in an ethical way. It's just not ethical, but it is the default. It is what's happening now. Fully agree on that. Thank you. So, uh, Terry, if you want to go okay. ahead. Uh, thanks, Pascal. I'd like to um, thank you all for a fantastic panel. I really love the way this uh, uh, conversation is going. And also, I think it raised some very interesting points, especially to me, who hasn't necessarily worked so much in that interface between sub-symbolic learning and uh, general reasoning with symbolic data. Now, in my background, I've often thought of machine learning as actually that knowledge elicitation or acquisition tool where we can use it to gather the data symbolically and build up our ontologies. And it goes back to the earlier days of AI, et cetera. I really am curious about that synergy that we get with deep learning models. But one thing we had with symbolic data was the ability to inspect and validate, check logically the veracity of our data um, and then reuse it. How do you see us being able to take sub-symbolic models, those models that one would acquire from a deep learning and use them in a similar way? I don't think it can be done as such. I, I think this is where we need to do the work. I, I think you're right that you need to have that inspectable knowledge. You need it for interfacing with humans. You need it for reasoning. And if you don't have it, then what you have are approximations. <clears throat> you can't trust the approximations. That's where we are now. That's why we need research in neurosymbolic AI. We don't really know quite the way to bridge it. In fact, I don't think it's going to be one, but many. 
but I think one of the projects of neurosymbolic AI is to find ways of learning symbolic knowledge at scale, which might look like deep learning, or it might take some of the spirit of deep learning, but actually in technical terms be pretty different. Um, I think the problem is people are looking for a magic bullet where they do that without having a lot of common sense knowledge previously. So they just do it by looking at corpus statistics and the corpus statistics are a reflection of how we use language, but they're like a shadow of the world. And they're not actually, these systems aren't then trying to say, well, what is the world? Let me infer what the world might be relative to the sample of data that I've drawn from the world. Um, and so it's just too crude. And I, I think the right answer is going to require really hard work where we build models of the things we're describing in the world. Like if we're, I don't know, wa watching a story, we need to build models of the characters. We can't just look at the words in that story. We need to know which characters are doing what and why, which is ultimately symbolic. And so we might use deep learning as a tool to get there, but I'm, I'm with you. We have to go back to ontologies and stuff like that, or we're just not going to solve the problem. Any other comments on that? Uh, I agree uh, about the statements. Uh, I want to see is that uh, uh, ontology and the knowledge graph is uh, uh, the foundation of a cognition, but uh, uh, I think the knowledge is not enough for the uh, computer to perform reasoning. What I want to say is that uh, uh, both deep learning and the knowledge graph is a representation of the model. The knowledge graph is in human level and uh, the deep learning representation learning is in machine level. They are have a um, greater gaps. Uh, what I want to see that uh, we cannot complete our knowledge graph, but uh, we can use the ontology or, or hyper meta ontology to be the guidance to prompt or to uh, obtain the to combine the knowledge representation learning uh, from deep learning, but not by instant, not uh, to extract knowledge from uh, the deep learning models. I think we should uh, combine these two representation learning methods, then we can uh, to perform reasoning, un uncertainty reasoning. I think it's a, a important thing to achieve the intelligence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, to, to, to chime in here, uh, what the Jun Zi just said, I mean, uh, you know, I think meaning, meaning negotiation is one crucial aspect that semantic web technologies have to deal with, right? And negotiating meeting between humans is very easy. Between humans and machine, that's where you need the, the computational representation of, 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 me, of meaning and so on. Now, shifting too much towards deep learning, we are really risking, again, going back to the hype, the good and the bad, we are risking to forget what we are doing, what, why we are developing these technologies. It's not just about eliciting from uh, big data some form of representation, but some form of representation that also is usable by humans. And this is not trivial. This is the mission, I think, one of the, the core missions of Semantic Web. Absolutely. David, do you want to go? Thank you. Well, may, yes. may I just offer a comment in response? All right. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say, um, I'm fascinated by the answers. I would absolutely, sorry, David, I would absolutely agree with uh, the comment on um, meaning negotiation. And one thought that comes to mind, and perhaps some, it's an avenue for exploration, is when one looks at models such as generative adversarial neural networks, or these models where you can actually capture transient or uh, instantaneous knowledge, as um, Laurie was talking about earlier, but then possibly start to infer symbolic knowledge from that symbolic format for future use, at least through um, uh, ontology uh, evolution or something. So that could be a way we move forward. But I suppose that's another conversation. I should have hand over to David. So thank you very much, people. David, go ahead. Thank you. So my question is just to all the panel. So I was thinking, imagine a future where you have a semantic web system, like a deep learning system, that can solve very complex problems, like today only a human can do. So how, how likely do you think that such a system will 
represent knowledge internally explicit in a symbolic way and not just for interpretability but just for capability and if so what what form do you think that representation will have will it be ontologies will it be logic what what form of representation do you think that will use thank you Nine, and let me, let me I, just just a second gary um let, let me let me also add to this the question which uh is by yt because i think it's very related um he said do you think the future will be more deep learning with included symbolics or symbolics with included deep learning right kind of what what how do you project that sorry gary, gary back to you yt is start. youtube uh sorry I, i'll start with the numbers um, 99.9999% sure that it will include symbolic information, it will include ontologies, it will include reasoning. We have no other ways to do kind of reliable human plus uh, reasoning over, over complex things. It, it's just a, a fantasy. I mean, there are things like, you know, new, new model from Google that does reasonably well on a medical licensing test. But there are questions there about data leakage and so forth. And if you want to do these things out in the open domain, um, you're just going to have to do that. I cannot see another way. And none of the results that I have seen make me think otherwise. There will always be extra distribution um, challenges. And so we, we have to have uh, a whole bunch of that. Now, there's a question about like how much of it will be deep learning and how much of it will be symbolic. I don't think we know that. I think we know that you're going to have to have some symbolic representations in there somewhere and do some symbolic reasoning. Um, you know, often, like, like here's an example, in driving 95% of what you can do, you can do by reflex and, and do it by deep learning. But the other 5% makes the difference between whether you, you plow into a, a jet that's parked in a runway or not. And so, you know, it can make a massive difference, the 5% of those outlying cases. And so, you know, maybe statistically more of the cases will be deep learning, um, think about the long tail graph that I showed. It's the long tail cases where we really need to have the symbolic systems. Most things aren't in the long tail, but they really matter if you're talking about a high stakes problem. If you're talking about a low stakes problem of placing advertisements, you don't need to go out into that tail because you don't care if you get it wrong. But if you're, if you're giving medical advice, you need to be out in that tail and, and you, you need to have the symbolic knowledge. I mean, if I can add, I think, I mean, I agree that it's a very difficult question, like especially giving an estimate of which one, which one would be more. We don't even know that for humans, really. Like, we kind of assume it's something, right. but we don't know whether we, we have, like, we use more symbols or we use more learning from data. I mean, the, uh, the cognitive scientists have this concept of image schema. They say, oh, we have these uh, sp uh, spatial temporal concepts that are innate, uh, like we learn when we are children, when we are babies, what a contain concept of a containment is. But these are just speculations, really. We can't really know that. So I think, I mean, the only way we can go with that is like we will try to see in some cases, as Gary says, there will be more like more symbols with, uh, with, with learning. And in some other cases, it will be the other way around. It has served some people's interest to pretend that the answer to that question was zero, and they have gotten a lot of funding that way by pretending that it's zero. Um, the reality that I think we all see is that it is not zero. And once it's not zero, then you're into a whole different space of architectures that have been underexplored because people have spent so much time on the zero side of the equation. Uh, just a minor comment, uh, just to stress what Ilaria said. I think if somebody is interested in something in between uh, the work on uh, image schemas, uh, uh, also uh, in connection with semantic web uh, technologies, uh, like for instance, Tony Deal uh, in uh, Trinity College in Dublin is, is been doing um, you know, stuff on uh, conceptual, conceptual spaces, um, computational metaphor, for many years now, and I think that work is really uh, relevant. Again, if we are talking about uh, types of representations and also the goal a little bit beyond just the dichotomy, symbolics are symbolic uh, sometimes. Um, and just another minor comment, I don't think neuro-symbolic AI is the uh, you know, solution, the, the panacea, the solution for everything. It's just, you know, we have so much uh, knowledge uh, uh, represented in computational formats. 
we have deep learning. This marriage is, is something that we are dealing with because it's useful. And, but I don't know if in the future this marriage will continue. Maybe some other form will, uh, will, be, uh, will, will emerge. But definitely no form that will, uh, uh, that, that will um, be not based on some symbolic representation because this is the way which we can have access to that. Um, uh, I just had a side conversation with Claudia. So uh, we officially have three more minutes, right? But um, uh, I'm, I am I can stay around a bit longer um, and uh, I believe we can leave the, the channel open. So kind of let's leave that up to the panelists if they want to do this. Um, uh, since it's three minutes, um, um, I want to pick one one question. There, there are three three really interesting questions. I want to pick one out out, out of the ones we we have um, uh, uh, as the final one before we kind of close officially. And then, if if the panelists can stay around, please do, um, uh, because it, it's in a on a very different topic. Um, uh, Ragua asks. Um, he says, Tutorial courses in neurosymbolic AI are required to inspire, introduce the next generation of researchers in this area. What, in your opinion, are the foundational important topics that need to be discussed in such a course? So if you were to make a class on neurosymbolic AI, what would you teach? I think that the fundamental questions are, how do you incorporate prior knowledge into algorithms that learn about the world? How do you extract symbolic knowledge from those algorithms? And how do you generalize outside the distribution of cases that you've seen before? Good answers to any of those three would be a revolution and understanding why none of our answers to any of those three are yet adequate would be a really good education. Other thoughts on this? <sighs> yeah, so I, I feel that uh, there is less and less, there are less and less students that no uh, basic uh, uh, differences between syntax, semantics, uh, what does it mean to represent knowledge? And if they start by only knowing, you know, again, one book, you know, Cave Hominem Mulius, uh, Libri, then is, the, the risk is even worse. Now that I think about, if I could uh, put another slide to my presentation, the risk is that we are forming scientists of the future that we ignore the knowledge representation side of, of, of all these enterprise. And that means uh, uh, annihilation, <laughs> if you want. Shuenzi, uh, I saw you were unmuting yourself, uh, if you want to comment. Yeah. Um, uh, what I want to say is that uh, oh, we should keep the, the key problems in symbolic, uh, in symbolic, uh, uh, reasoning, uh, such as the the content uh, deep understanding and uh, the reasoning, I think in the future maybe uh, the combined uh, um, method or the uh, combined deep learning and knowledge driven system will be the future. But keep in mind that um, that what we want to achieve is reliable reliable AI. But we can use the uh, the powerful deep learning model to help to uh, to enhance the reasoning, and also we can uh, we can do the we can uh, use uh, pre-trained language model as the resource for our reasoning. I think it's a simple neural neural network method. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So um, I, I want to do a, a quick plug before before we close the, the official session. Um, uh, we we have an agreement with with iOS Press to start a new journal on neurosymbolic artificial intelligence. So there will be there will be an. Um, uh, an official announcement in whatever, two or three weeks, hopefully. We, in that case, Editors-in-Chief, Tarek Bezold, Arthur Garces, and myself. So just wanted to use this uh, as uh, kind of to announce that. Um, all right, so uh, let me officially thank all the panelists. Um, Joancy, Ilaria, Alessandro, Gary, thanks a lot. Thanks for the insights. Thanks for the controversial statements as well. Um, we still have two questions in the chat. 
Um, so I, I, I suggest we just uh, keep going for a little bit. Um, and if anybody else wants to contribute, uh, you can also raise your hand and we'll, we'll kind of give you a microphone, uh, <coughs> perhaps for another whatever 20 minutes or so uh, as we manage. And if any of the panelists need to leave, then, then please, of course, feel free to do so. Apologies that I have to go. Thanks very much, everyone. Of course. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Gary. Um, so the question from, from Maria Keat, um, could they, uh, in the context it was referring to symbolic and, and, and deep learning uh, or semantic web and deep learning, could they possibly ha happily exist side by side in five to 10 years time, like using sub-symbolic for, for some tasks and symbolic for other tasks, rather than competing on who's the coolest uh, on the tasks and the repeated seesawing of emphasis on one or the other? Uh, perhaps just some mixing on some subtasks topics, uh, like everything jointly or only one or the other. But, but yeah, I think uh, it's definitely about not a competition. But I mean, we're talking about integration. But I, I at least in 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 my mind, they kind of get combined into different uh, pieces. I don't think we need to aim at all, and I don't even think uh, people have in mind a competition really. And uh, uh, and I think as a community in general, we should really make an effort not to compete. So it's not about they go to their conferences, we go to our conferences, but we really try to make this integration. Um, uh, there's also this very, uh, I think it's also published in one of these neurosymbolic, um, the, the work that uh, uh, Frank and, uh, and some other people have done on this boxology for neurosymbolic. Uh, systems where where you have I mean they did basically semi formalized uh, methods where you integrate uh, symbolic methods and learning methods together into into a pipeline with inputs and outputs um, and some outputs and inputs are uh, symbolic some others are sub symbolic so it's definitely about designing systems that integrate like, that you can subsect into subtasks and then each one of them does it in, in the best way this can be done, whether symbolically or not. So at least this is when I talk about it, I think of not a competition, but a real integration chaining of things that work well. Uh, uh, from um, aspect of my opinion, because I'm uh, studying semantic web and uh, uh, knowledge representation and the natural language understanding. So what I want to do is that I want to use deep learning method and uh, the um, print training model to be the boost for my for our tasks in semantic web and. Uh, uh, natural language understanding. This is uh, uh, first I want to do. Uh, I just want to use advanced deep learning method to solve the problem of uh, um, my research areas. Uh, the the other direction is that uh, I think the deep learning method cannot uh, uh, separate with uh, the uh, symbolic method to achieve the uh, semantics. So this is the other direction. So um, currently I think maybe the mechani mechanism of the uh, deep learning method and the print language model uh, need to be uh, invested, investigated deeply to know his mechanism so that we can combine the symbolic and the neural method uh, properly, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm also just because we are beyond the time, I can add a bit of my opinion. <laughs> you need to go, Sorry. Ilaria? Yeah, um, thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks, <laughs> of course, time, yes. Like a bit earlier, it's going to be easier. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, Thanks. so so yeah, perhaps since we're off the official time, I can probably add a little bit of my opinion as well. I, I don't think deep learning will be gone in 10 years. Um, uh, I, I think it will be just, you know, much more one technology 
uh, because that's what happens, right? It, it's one technique, but we will have a much better understanding of what it can do and what it cannot do, right? Which is only sl very slowly becoming apparent these days. And then, of course, you know, it becomes part of the tool arsenal and uh, and people will look how we can combine it with other things. It's just natural, yes. right? Of course, mm -hmm. I'm banking on neurosymbolic, right? I, I, I really see a lot of, lot of chances there. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, we really don't know how it will pan out. So anyway, another mm -hmm. question um, by, by Anna, which is com completely different. Uh, but I, it's, 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 I think, a, a, a really important one. So um, she says, a colleague of mine wondered last week, I wonder if semantic web and highly sophisticated data models are perceived as luxury products in the world outside of developed countries. Also, the semantic web has often been perceived as unrealistic. And yesterday, someone said, not without controversy, that we need to cater more to the views of developers, of which there are much more in the world than ontology experts. Does the panel have any ideas on how to make the image of the semantic web less ivory towery and more inclusive, which would also help with the diversity aspect in ontologies? It's not exactly a neurosymbolic question, right? But, but still, if you have opinions on this, then... Um, I think it's an interesting uh, question, and uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if I have an answer, but uh, this, I think, is a very old uh, problem that we've been facing since uh, we started to talk about uh, uh, ontologies, uh, and applied ontology, and, you know, providing semantics uh, to, to data, and then you get the question, what is the difference between a relational database and a knowledge graph, uh, what is that you are doing that we cannot do with these other means? Um, and probably the, the reason why we are getting this question over and over and, and even reformulated, re, re, rephrased over time is because we are not doing a good job in uh, explaining what the answers are. Uh, uh, sometimes it's also true that maybe we, you know, we are not doing a, a too bad job, but... Uh, on the other side, uh, there's also some resistance. Uh, I don't have, again, a solution, but that's how, to the, how I see this problem in my, let's say, my, my experience and daily, daily life, in a sense. Um, yeah. Joanzi, you, you want to comment on this? Yeah, uh, I have no more comments. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so, so perhaps, perhaps my, own, my own take on this, and, and then we'll, 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 close, mm -hmm. we'll close the panel. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it is, it is uh, co a completely correct observation that so many web technologies are still very top heavy uh, in a sense. So, I mean, but I mean, something that really changed uh, in the last whatever uh, decade uh, is knowledge graphs now seem to be, you know, the, the driving method of, of data management in, in big IT companies, for example, and others see the added value, but it's still a ton of work to get them started. So that there is a lot of, a lot of upfront cost to them. And um, of course, that's, that's, that's in a sense, um, just how it is right now. But that does not mean that this is the end of the story. Right. So integrating two knowledge graphs can be a terrible pain. But if you have the data in whatever other formats, it's even more of a pain. <laughs> So we've we've done something. We accomplished something, right? And I think the next steps uh, here need to be: how do we make it even easier, right? And and part of that may be, you know, better intelligent system supports using some deep learning systems for some things, right? Um, and the other will be going back to our our kind of old symbolic approaches as well, but thinking more about how do we actually, you know, get it down to earth such that it's, it's, it's even less of a pain than it is right now. Uh, and only then, you know, will, will adoption be much more widespread, will smaller companies and then also, uh, you know, areas which probably in the world, which, which probably don't have the funds to do this, this kind of upfront investing, uh, will be able to catch up. So I think we still have some time to go here, a way to go here. All right. Any final comments from, from uh, you, Shwansi, or you, Alessandro? Mm. There is a long way to go <laughs> to achieve the semantics on the web, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no more comments from me. Just, you know, thank you again for the invite. For the thank I you. I really enjoyed this discussion and the questions. Thank you also for putting us. And uh, 
thanks to you two and, and to those who already left and thanks to the audience. Uh, we actually still have almost 60 people around. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. And mm -hmm. um, I hope it was, it was insightful and enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Pascal. It was great. Uh, you are muted. Pascal, you are muted. Yes, I think so too. I, I think okay. it was, was, was very nice. So excellent. Thanks a lot, Claudia. Catch you soon. Yeah. Thanks for getting this getting this running and you know suggesting to do it on this topic. So this no, I think it, it was a very uh, interesting topic wor worthwhile to have at this conference and thanks for arranging it. It was just great. Thank you. Of course. Thanks. Catch you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. IBM Research.